you're picking up. If you are new with us, we're teaching through the Gospel of Mark, and so we're going to be in the Gospel of Mark for a uh, few weeks or months uh, to go. Today is the wildest, most bizarre, true story of demonic possession that we find in the New Testament. And when I say wild, bizarre, true story, it's the inspired Word of God. Uh, it is inerrant. It's God's Word for us. It's God's revelation to us. Also, this is not the first encounter with demonic possession in the Gospel of Mark. We see it in Mark chapter 1, where the Bible tells us, and if you were here back then, we talked through that. The Gospel says there was a man with an unclean spirit that was in the synagogue that cried out and said, what business do we have with each other? Jesus, the Holy One, I know who you are. And the Lord cast the demon out there. Well, we get to this passage today where we have a man, and, and basically, and going along with the, uh, what we have with the parallel Part of the story found in the Gospel of Matthew, he tells there are two guys that are demon possessed. Mark focuses only on this one, but these guys are not just possessed by one demon, but by many. In fact, when the Lord asks them, What is your name? they say, Legion. Legion was a word in that day and time, and even day in the Roman uh, military, it meant 6,000. Now, I don't know exactly if the two guys, particularly in this passage of Mark, that one guy had 6,000 demons within him, but you know, I, I went, uh, grew up in Bisco, went to school at Duval's Bluff. What does that mean? That means a whole bunch. That's what that means, okay? So he had a whole lot of demons within him. Now, demons are fallen angels. Back before Adam and Eve, sometime after the creation of the world, we see it in Isaiah 14. You'll find it in the uh, uh, prophet Ezekiel. But Satan wanted to usurp God. He wanted to be like God. He was cast out of heaven. And the Bible tells us that one-third of the angelic beings were cast out with him. So when the Bible talks about angels, they are the messengers of God. When he talks about angels, the Bible refers to them as mirage upon mirage, and that means, like I said, a whole bunch. So one-third of a whole bunch is still a whole bunch. And they've been cast out upon this earth. Now, there's no need to be in fear as a believer. As a believer, Satan himself, demonic uh, beings cannot inhabit you. They cannot possess you as a believer. The Bible says in 1 John 4.4, 4, greater is he who is in us than he who is in the world. So a born-again believer cannot be possessed. But what can happen in the life of a believer, they can be oppressed by a demonic being or they can be influenced. And influence and oppressed can kind of go along in the same way. And so as we work through this passage of scripture this morning, don't, don't weird out on me, Okay. You don't have to go into panic mode. You don't have to be afraid. But today as a believer, many of you are believers here, this is an opportunity to grow in your understanding of demonic beings. The Bible says in Ephesians chapter 6, Paul, Riley Church at Ephesus said, this war we have is not against flesh and blood, but against principality and powers and rulers of darkness. There is a hierarchy of demonic beings out there led by Satan who know what their end is and in fact, we're going to see that in this past script. So as a believer, hopefully today it's going, to, it's going to disciple you. It's going to encourage you. But also today, I think what we'll see many times what happens in the life of a believer is that we can, we can get in the flesh and we can get mad at an individual, whether a family member, whether a friend, maybe an associate, or maybe someone we don't know. We get mad at the individual because of their actions. Now, there are consequences to our actions. I think everybody understands that. Whether if you don't know what you're doing or know what you're doing, there's consequences. But sometimes we get so mad at the individual, we don't realize who is behind the evil of the individual. And I think this passage today will help bring that to light to help us understand some of the current events that are happening today in our nation and around the world. Now, I know you just got comfortable, and I know you're the 11 o'clock crowd and you're thinking about lunch, but stay with me. If you don't mind, if you're able, please stand. Instead of me telling you about this story and this guy with so many demons in him, I'm gonna read it to you. They came to the other side of the sea into the country of the Gazarenes. When he got out of the boat immediately, a man from the tombs with an unclean spirit met him. And he had his dwelling among the tombs, so it's a graveyard, and no one was able to bind him anymore, even with the chain, because he had often been bound with shackles and chains, and the chains had been torn apart by him, and the shackles broken in pieces, no one was strong enough to subdue him. And constantly, night and day, he was screaming among the tombs and in the mountains. He was gashing himself with stones. And seeing Jesus from a distance, he ran up, bowed down before him. And shouting with a loud voice, he said, 
What business do we have with each other? Jesus, now get this title, son of the most high God, I implore you. This word implore means to persuade, it means to beg. I beg you, I implore you, by God, do not torment me. For he'd been saying to him, come out of the man, you unclean spirit. And he was asking him, Jesus asked, what's your name? He said to him, my name is Legion, for we are many. And he began to implore him earnestly not to send them out of the country. And there was a a large herd of swine feeding nearby on the mountain. And the demons implored him, saying, send us into the swine so that we may enter them. Now, this is good. Jesus gave them permission. And coming out, the unclean spirits entered the swine. The herd rushed down the steep bank in the sea. About 2,000 of them, they were drowned in the sea. And their herdsmen ran away, reported it to the city and in the country. And the people came to see what was that that had happened. And they came to Jesus, and they observed the man who had been demon-possessed, sitting down, clothed, in his right mind, the very man who had the legion, and they became frightened. And those who had seen it described to them how it happened. The demon-possessed man all about the swine. Now look at 17. You see, not only does Jesus do something very powerful here in the life of the man, but we see how people respond in a very different way. They began to implore him to leave the region. As he was getting into the boat, the man who had been demon-possessed was imploring him, that word's used a lot, that he might accompany him. And he did not let him, but he said, go home to your people. Report to them what great things the Lord has done for you and how he had mercy on you. And he went away, began to proclaim in Decapolis what great things Jesus had done for him. And everyone was amazed. Father, we pray in the name of Jesus, Lord Jesus, because there is nobody but you. Thank you for dying on that cross, shedding your blood for us. Thank you that, uh, Lord, that you came out of that tomb on the third day. Thank you that we come to you in repentance and faith. We come confessing you as Lord and Savior. And you tell us in Scripture, you will save us. You will save us, Lord, from our sins. And so, Lord, I pray today for believers, you disciple, you teach us. But, Lord, I pray you save somebody today. It's in your name we pray, the name of Jesus. And again, all God's people said, amen, amen. Please be seated if you would. Thanks for standing for the uh, public reading of Scripture. So we're picking up where we left off last week. Last week, we see the Lord Jesus Christ disciples get in the boat, go across the Sea of Galilee. Big storm comes up, okay? It's, the, it's in the evening when that all happens and takes place. So it's dark. Storm comes up. The disciples are in a panic. Jesus, in the distinguished place in the boat on the cushion, as Pastor Kenzie pointed out last week, is where Jesus was asleep. And so the, the disciples are frightened. They're scared. They wake him up. Do you not care that we're perishing? And he gets up and rebukes the wind and waves. So what he does, he, he demonstrates his deity, his supernatural divinity, his power over all nature. And he quiets everything down. So get this. So I'm very visual. So you got disciples, okay, a lot of them fishermen, you know, that really know how to handle a boat. And they're so afraid, they wake Jesus up and say, we're going to die and you don't even care about us. And so he calms everything down. Now, I don't know about you. In a boat like that, I know now they wouldn't, but me, I'd be sick. I'm talking about physically sick. And I would be rowing in that boat in the calm water after the storm, probably looking at my friends going, what just happened you know, and I would be physically weak in the knees, most likely. And I would be looking at that seashore thinking, just let me get over on land. Just let me get over on land. Let me process all that I have just witnessed in the dark. So can you imagine, you get over there and you get out of the boat and you're thinking, okay, a little peace. We're away from the crowds. And then all of a sudden there's a crazy guy who's running out of the tombs, the graveyard, screaming and hollering. He's naked. If you go to Matthew, the Bible says he has no clothes on. And he's coming out of the graveyard, screaming and hollering, running towards you on the back. I don't know about you, but I would have been scared to death, right? I've been scared to death. And so we see that happening. So the Bible tells us that guy comes out and he says, he had his dwelling among the tombs. That means he was more comfortable as a demon-possessed man living among the dead than the living. But also, too, here's what's... Uh, Unique about the passage. This man had supernatural strength that he had. So the Bible says that he would break chains and shackles. Now, if you have a chain at your house, you go home. If you don't have anything, do this afternoon. Go out there and grab a hold of it. Let's see how strong you are in that. He was supernaturally enhanced by all of these demonic beings. He would tear chains. And it says nobody could subdue him. Now, while I grew up in a small town, there's always what I would recognize in a town where I grew up among the older men, the toughest guy Abisco. 
He was a guy that you wanted to be your friend. He was a guy that would, hey, he would defend women. He would, def- he would defend puppy dogs. I mean, he was just that guy. And he would do all that. But he was just very strong. Can you imagine there was no one in the village strong enough to subdue this guy? So maybe you had this strong guy of the village, the strongest one. He's got two or three brothers. They go out, try to subdue the demon, demon-possessed guy, and he just whips all of them. I mean, that's kind of what it was like. And so there is a, you have the physical aspect of this, of being inhabited, by these fallen angels that were kicked out of heaven right there even before Adam and Eve because we know that Satan shows up in the garden. Revelation 12, you can go read it. Revelation 12 is out there but looks back at when uh, Satan and those demonic beings were cast out. Jesus had a lot of encounters uh, with these demonic beings that we see, these fallen angels inhabiting people. And you look around today, across the world, something like this you can find in places around the world today a physical manifestation of that demonic possession. But also, too, what you see, and you can even find it here in the uh, U.S., is that it's hidden. You see, the Bible says that Satan masquerades as an angel of light. Google it, look the passage up. The Bible says that Satan has blinded the minds of the unbelieving that they will not believe. The Bible says that Satan is a roaring lion looking for someone to devour. Satan will not always appear like he does here in thousands of demons possessing two guys who are living in the tombs who are running around without any clothes. Satan can show up in the synagogue. Satan, Satan can inhabit and possess or oppress or influence a false teacher. You see, sometimes we look at stuff. So you remember the guy who had the cultic following, who encouraged all of his followers to drink the poison because they were gonna move into the next life because whatever, the spaceship was coming behind the comet. And you may think, well, that guy was just crazy. That guy was demonically influenced. Demons want to steal, kill, and destroy. They want to destroy the works of God. They want to destroy everything uh, around you, anything they can. This is demonic means. This is what they will do. And so we see this kind of, throughout Scripture now, there's not a demon behind every tree and that kind of stuff. But there are thousands upon thousands upon thousands of fallen angels who have been here since the time they were kicked out. And 2,000 years ago, what the Holy Spirit has allowed us to see in the inspiration of Scripture is these two guys, particularly as Mark focuses on the one that are full with these demons. So there's a physical aspect, but it's also the aspect, there's a lot of symbolism here. And symbolism is this man represents complete, total depravity. You know, when you think about, well, the man doesn't have any clothes on. Well, I don't know about you, but that's just plumb weird, okay? It's just weird. Why is that? You say, well, the demon has ripped his clothes off of him. Do you know that is symbolic of sexuality and sensuality and immorality? You see, it's a common thing for most people to be very modest. It's a common thing to be very modest. For those, those demons to rip their clothes off, of, it is a symbolic of all that stuff in there. All that rage, all that violence, all that anger, all that bitterness that is within him as they're controlling his mind, his voice, his body. It's all symbolic of complete depravity, total separation from God. And so we have him. So you can imagine, he comes running down, screaming hard. He's very strong. They can't subdue him. And uh, he comes down, and he falls at the feet of Jesus, bows down. That word bow means worship. He's not coming in repentance. It's coming in faith. So the strongest man in the village, the strongest guy, the roughest guy, the toughest guy who defends women and loves puppy dog, okay? The strongest guy you can imagine. Couldn't do anything with him. Chains couldn't hold him. Shackles. The Bible says, tear him to pieces. But in the presence of Jesus, he falls on his knees. Basically, I just, what, what happened? Here's how I envision this. So, there's a part of me, because we don't know in the text. So, this is what you call supposing upon the text. There's a part of me thinking, this guy's up there in the tombs. It was a divine appointment, we know. The, the disciples are thinking, please let us get on dry ground and let's get our thoughts together. This is a divine appointment. He probably looks down and he's like, oh, some fresh victims down here. I'm about to unleash chaos and havoc on them, okay? Because you got to realize Satan hates everybody. He hates the things of God. He hates everybody. And so probably he's up in the tombs. He sees them down there in the dark, 
or as one writer says, probably early morning. So he sees him, he's like, I'm about to whip all of them, okay? And he comes running down there, and all of a sudden he gets closer. Can you imagine? You ever been in a situation like, I better pump the brakes on this? It's almost like, oh no, because he recognized him. And he falls down in the presence. And here's what he says, very, very intentional, very divine. He says, Jesus, son of the most high. Son of the most high title means God of sovereignty over all powers and all things. I don't know if you, if I was the disciples, I was a Peter, I'd be like, what just happened here? He falls down. And he says, what business do we have with each other? Have you come to torment us? Have you come as, and Mark 1, the source. Uh, Matthew says, before the time. You know, demons, uh, it says, they believe and tremble. It's not saving faith. Their theology, their eschatology is correct. They know who he was. You may be here today, and you may say, oh, look, preacher, I don't believe that mess. Every demon believes, dear friend. Well, I don't believe he's the son of God. Every demon believes and knows he is the son of God. Well, I don't think he's a creator. Every demon believes and knows he is the creator God, but yet we sit in church Sunday after Sunday and reject. What the demons know is true. They're more theological than probably a lot of Baptist church members. And also eschatology. Because here's what they know. So you gotta imagine it. I, I presume it's kind of like this. They went, uh-oh, here's Jesus, son of the most high. He's not supposed to do this right now. You say, what do you mean? They know, they know the end is coming, but they know it's coming in the second coming. They know, and they're like, what? Okay, don't torment us here. Don't send us to the abyss. See, Jude 6 says there are angels, angels who left their proper abode and they're cast into the abyss. I believe that goes back to Genesis 6 where it says the sons of God saw the daughters of men and had a relationship with them. Those fallen angels happened in Genesis 6 are cast in hell. They're like, please don't send us down there because those folks are locked up down there. Those demonic angels are locked up. Please don't send us there. Why have, why, have you come to torment us? Have you come to do this before the time? You see, their eschatology is correct. And the Lord asked him, he said, what's your name? They say, Legion. Now, again, that's 6,000 soldiers in a Roman military. That's a whole lot. And you say, could it be exactly 6,000? Get to heaven, ask Jesus for sure. You know, but it's just a bunch. It's most likely thousands upon thousands, could be exactly 6,000. And you, you see this. Now, here's the thing. These are, again, greater is he who is in us and he who is in the world. And what we see is that demonic beings want to cause havoc. They want to cause chaos. They want to sow discord. They attack the things of God. They, they want to cause great pain and great evil. Uh, and they want to... They want to hurt folks, and there's a lot of hatred. So we see a lot of stuff in our culture. When you imagine someone who is a serial killer that we probably all read about, maybe you studied in school, maybe you took uh, a class at college or whatever, but a serial killer, someone who just has this push and this desire, and it's just murder after murder after murder. You say, well, that person's deranged. Most likely that person is demonically influenced is demonically oppressed or could be demonically possessed. Now, as I said, Satan's not behind every action. But a lot of stuff that here in America that we probably deny is a satanic influence. And so you just take that for example. But then also too, if you look at any racism that's out there, that's a hatred of somebody because they're different from you. Whether it's you like hate white people, you hate black people, you hate uh, Asian people, you just say people in general and that kind of stuff. That is a great evil because we're all made in God's image. Come on, amen? And so it's not about skin color in regard to that, but that racism. So, you know, a lot of us uh, grew up in the South. I was born in the late 60s, 65, and so you had peace signs, you had marijuana, you had bell bottom blue jeans, and like little minivans running around painted yellow. Okay, I remember all that stuff. And bell bottoms are back in, I think they're back in style now, whatever. So they go and come. But that's kind of funny in a way, you know, but you know what I'm talking about. But, uh, you know, there was, but even in the South, though, there was racism against other people because of skin color. That's evil. That's a place for an amen. I mean, that's evil. And you say, well, they, people just like that. Well, let me tell you that's wrong. But you need to understand, that's what Satan wants. 
You see, that's an evil. And so sometimes what happens, and yes, there are bad people who do bad things, and there's consequences of that. But what happens a lot of times is you point at that person and you begin to hate that person because they are racist or hate other people, but you got to back away and realize there is an evil in regard to that. So let me help you understand what we're seeing today in our country. We're seeing anti-Semitism today. We're seeing a hatred of the Jewish people today. And, and what's happening is, if you've been watching the news, you even see that occurring on college campuses. Well, you need to be kind of grown up and step back and just go, why? We need to step back and ask the question of why do we see this? And that's really this week as I've, I've watched the news and I've listened to people get interviewed and heard comments and I've did some research and stuff. And I've just begun to wonder why because there was a point this week when I got mad. I don't know about you. I know you're saintly and godly and you don't ever get in the flesh and get angry, okay? Well, I guess you are. Okay, so anyway, I got in the flesh. Look, I've traveled in other countries and America is not perfect. And you know what? We have, when you think about demonic influence around other countries, you go into India and places like that, or a place there's demonic influence, demonic strongholds. Do you realize in America, we have a billion dollar pornography industry? That's a demonic stronghold. Do you realize in America there's sex trafficking of men and women, of boys and girls sold into sex slavery? Do you realize that that is a demonic stronghold and a demonic influence. And you can't really say, well, people just people, whatever. Yeah, people just people because they're sinners and they're lost. But there is a demonic evil. That is just evil that exists. So I will acknowledge that in our country. But I've traveled in other places and this is where I choose to live. And when you take that United States flag down and you fly a Palestinian flag, I don't know about you, I just made me mad over that. I don't want to live in Iran. I don't want to live anywhere else. I know we're not perfect in this. But I had to step back and go, what in the world? And then I would listen. People would make a, they would, they would do the chant from the river to the sea. Well, you ought to go research that. You know what that means? The, the exact eradication of Israel from the Jordan River to the Mediterranean Sea. Look, at it's a small country over there. We're talking about the annihilation of a whole group of people off the map. And what happens is, I, I would watch some of these young men and women, and they would say that, and I would think in my mind, now, if I was in college, what would I do if I was 18 years old? And then I thought, I thought, most of the, a lot of those individuals don't even know what they're saying. But why is that? Because there's an influence of hatred. And I believe it's a demonic influence of hatred. That it didn't just start. It has always been a hatred of the Jewish people from the beginning in regard to this. So you would see that happening and, and taking place. And then you would interview, there would be a college student interviewed about October 7th. And here's what they'd say, that didn't take place. And I'm thinking, there's video of Hamas terrorists slaughtering men and women and girls and boys and babies, 1,200. Uh, you probably don't remember it. That Sunday after that uh, slaughter took place, that invasion took place. Uh, into Israel, 1,200 people killed. I think I said, I probably said it because I'd heard it somewhere. That day was Israel's 9-11. I read an article out of the Washington Post because all the events that took place this week that's been happening on college cam campuses and in our culture and in America, I'm just kind of beginning to do research. Washington Post said this. They said, some of you refer to October 7th as Israel's 9-11. That's incorrect. Well, when I thought, well, I've been saying that, so I've said something's incorrect. He said, the writer said, there were 1,200 people slaughtered in a country that's less than 10 million. That's equivalent in America, 40,000 American citizens slaughtered in one day. If you want to compare the numbers, it's 40,000 Americans slaughtered in one day. And I thought, okay, I've never been in war. I don't want to be in war. I don't want to have to make the hard decisions. I appreciate our men and women who have served. Most of us have not been there. Okay, so there's been a lot of atrocities in war and people defending our nation. And man, I'm, I'm for our military men and women. I'm just glad I've never had to experience that, okay? But to, to see that type of a slaughter take place equivalent. So 3,500 people killed in a terrorist attack, the Twin Towers. Compare that to 40,000. Not taking people prisoner. Yes, there were... 200 and something hostages taken, 100 to 130 still held, five Americans still hostages. 
but didn't take prisoners of war necessarily, slaughtered people. Our state representatives in Arkansas, Governor Sanders, the Israeli embassy came in, showed the video, 30 minutes, unedited Hamas video, body cams, showing all that took place. And right now, we don't have access to that and probably would not want to see that. But here's something else, Red. Our generals, I think it's MacArthur in World War II, once they went into the death camps of Hitler, here's what he stated. He said, the journalists of America need to travel to these death camps to see. Now, some of you were way back then, okay? And you remember, or you studied it. They said, some of these journalists need to travel to America to see because our people do not understand the great slaughter of the Jewish people. And they said this, I think it's MacArthur said. I may have my generals wrong. But he said, he said the deal is, he said, America needs to know. They need to understand what happened here. Now, people today deny the Holocaust. And we know it's real. It is evil. It was evil then. It was evil way back then. It's evil today. Whether if it's evil against a white person, a black person, an Asian person, people of all colors, people of all nationalities, it is great evil. Where does it come from? How does it happen in this? How did this man here get to a place? It wasn't like he's walking down the street one day and pow, he's inhabited by 6,000 demons. He opened himself up to something. There was in Gentile worship, idol worship, and occult worship and stuff. So that's a way today. You can be influenced and open. You know, I've often shared this. You open yourself up to anything, you'll get something you don't want. And people say, well, you have freedom of your mind. Let me say it one more time. You open yourself up to anything, you may get something you don't want. I've often said this, especially uh, speaking to young ladies. I said, ladies, if you think you got to do something to attract a certain guy, you're probably going to get a guy you don't want or need. That's a place for every daddy that has a daughter to say amen. I mean, really, think about it. And so you can open yourself up to a cult and Gentile worship. Paul around the church at Corinth said, the Gentiles sacrifice to demons in this. Now, demons are not behind everything. There is a great evil that is all around, whether if it's pornography, sexuality, homosexuality, transgender, all this stuff. And sometimes we look at people and it causes us to get mad and it causes us to get angry. And all of a sudden we want to, we say, well, it's that person. Well, look, people can be influenced. They can be oppressed. They can be possessed. There's consequences of that. But realize who is the enemy. Ephesians 6, a war is not against flesh and blood, but principalities and powers, rulers of darkness. Folks, we're in a battle. Now, we know who wins, and the demons know it better than anybody. That's why he said, you come before the time? And so, they ask a question. This is where it gets you. I'm going to get you out of here in about four minutes, okay? They ask a question. Please don't send us out of the country. That is weird to me. Okay, they're in the northern part up here, around the Sea of Galilee. Don't send us out of the country. They don't want to go anywhere else. And they said, hey, there's a herd of swine over here. And they say... Send us into them. Now, you're not Jesus. I'm not Jesus. You're not a God, little God. Never will be a God. But if you were Jesus, what would, say? What would you do? Because they have a time coming when they're casting the lake of fire, but it's down the road. And we know so far it's been 2,000 years. And they want to go into these pigs, knowing that they're not always going to stay in those pigs, and they're going to go somewhere else. And Jesus gives them permission. You say, preacher, why did he give them permission? I don't know. All I know is he has a plan and a purpose. And the Bible says that they go into those pigs, those pigs go crazy, as you can imagine, run down a hill or drown in the Sea of Galilee. You say, what happened to the demons? They're still out there floating around in the northern part, at that time, northern part of Israel. And the herdsmen see it, and they go back to the city and they tell the people. So it's a communal thing. And the community owns it, and they come out. Okay, Now this is how people respond differently. They come out, and they hear the story of the herdsman, and they look at the guy, because they know him. He's been terrorizing their families for all these years, so they know who he is. And they're like, he's clothed. He's in his right mind, and he's at the feet of Jesus. And they are afraid, and then they ask Jesus to leave. Now, I don't know about you, 
But if I had a child who was sick, or I had a mother-in-law who was sick, or there was something crazy in the village, and I, I, I would say, that's something I have never seen before, but I'd say, that dude attacked me one time when I was walking through, he's terrorized all these people, and you know, uh, hey, I got a child that's sick at home, and if you, you seem to be like really nice, and he's in his right mind, and I don't get it, but I need you to come help my family. I want you to come to my village. I want you to come with me and heal my child. I want to know. I want to know what you did to him because he's right. He was wrong. Now he's right. He want to kill people. Now he's sane. I want to know what happened. They said, no. They basically said, Jesus, you go because we want the demons more than we want you. What did Jesus do? He gave them what they wanted. He started getting the boat. Let me help you with this as we close. I don't live anywhere else, but we are way far from perfect, and our nation is way far from God. We are wicked people, as Isaiah said, and we live among people among clean lips. We're wicked people. Think about all the trash and gunk and junk. Think about stuff that is on the news. Think about all the stuff that's happened. Think about all the immorality and wickedness. Everything contradicts the word of God. We are a wicked nation. I don't want to live anywhere else. But if we keep asking God to leave this nation, he's going to give us what we want. If you keep asking God to leave you alone, he's going to give you what you want. You know, I remember one time I was at a gas station. There was a lady who approached me after church. She just made this general statement to me. She said, we like our preachers to wear a tie I'm looking at her and I, I'm smiling and I'm thinking, I don't really know how to respond. I want to respond, but it's best for me not to respond. And I kept looking at her and I think, you don't go to church. And I thought, I ain't your preacher. So I don't know who the we and who you're talking about are preachers, plural, but I ain't your preacher. Now I say that because you may say, preacher, why did you have to bring this up today? Because this is the world events in which we live, that's why. And there's a great evil that's out there. And you need to understand as God's people what that evil is. And you need to understand what we face out there. And you need to understand greater is he who's in us and he who's in the world. And you need to understand the gospel can set the strongest stronghold free. We talk about deliverance and I talk about pornography and the addiction to pornography. You know what? Jesus Christ can set you free. You say, man, I got great anger and great bitterness in my life. Guess what? Jesus Christ can set you free, but you cannot reject him. You have to come to him. And so they said, we want the demons more than we want you. He said, I'm gonna give you what you want. She goes, get in the boat. But the demon-possessed man, here he comes. Like, hey, hey, ho, 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 where are you going? Because these people are crazy in the village. I wanna go with you. He's like, nope. He says, you know what? I'm paraphrasing. I'm really supposing upon a text. Probably something like this. Yeah, you're right. They're all crazy. But I need a witness. Tag, you're it. You can make a difference. And the Bible says, he goes. He says, tell them what I've done. He goes, and it says, people were amazed. Lord, there, folks, there are great atrocities and great evil. You can't hide your head in the sand you can't deny reality. You just need to know where the majority of it comes from. And I would encourage you. There's a lot of voices out there. You need to recognize the voice from above and you need to recognize the voice from below. Don't allow yourself to be influenced by the doctrine of demons. Racism, skin color, we are God's people created in his image. But here's something else we need to grasp and understand, whether we like it or not. In Genesis chapter 12, in the covenant with Abraham, God didn't, say, God didn't say, I will bless America and I will bless those who love America. He looked at Abraham, the Abrahamic covenant, which comes through Isaac, not in Ishmael, comes through Isaac, Israel. He says, I will bless those who bless you and I will curse those who curse you. You better take that passage to heart in these days and not allow the evil and hate. You know, I've often wondered, you, say, you said you're gonna close. I am really gonna close, okay? 
in the end of time, in the battle of Armageddon, the Bible seems pretty clear the nations come against Israel. You know, I've always wondered, because I've said, U.S. is not a player in the end days, my opinion. Because in my mind, I was thinking, they won't defend Israel. Probably not. Could be a country <laughs> that turns on Israel. How is it? Look around. The hatred of the Jewish people. Now, I don't know God's timetable. I just know we got to be the light in the dark. How did the nations turn against Israel? Just look around at the world. The handwriting's on the wall. And the mastermind, Satan himself, is behind it. But here's the other good news. He can only go as far as Christ allows him to go. And there's a purpose and a reason that probably I don't understand and maybe you don't. Fathers, we pray in this invitation this morning. Lord, as disciples of you, as followers of you, Lord, we live in difficult days, but it is no more difficult than it's always been. Lord, there is great evil and great darkness, and we see it and we know it, but, oh, Lord, that we may recognize it. And, Lord, understand that the gospel is what sets people free. So in the midst of the darkness, we preach the gospel. Lord, in the midst of the guard darkness we share the love of you Lord Jesus and we call for repentance and faith and we trust you with the outcome Lord so I pray across this room today that as believers it may be today that we may find ourselves as a believer that's been influenced in one way or another whatever that may be we may find ourselves that we have lost the joy of your salvation may today be a place for a believer maybe of repentance and maybe Lord just a fresh and new uh, revival occurring in our life but then Lord also I know this that, Lord, you set people free. You said, I've come to seek and save that which was lost. And so, Lord, in this room and engaging with us online, there are folks who today, Lord, you're drawing, you're calling them. May they respond to you. May they come in repentance and faith and be saved today. And may it be for your glory and honor. It's in your name we pray. In the name of Jesus, amen.